Behold, I am coming soon to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22, 12. These fiery words are nearly 2,000 years old, but they still sear the mind. They are the words of the last, and to many, the most dangerous book of the Bible, the bloodied and dazzling apocalypse known as the Revelation. The book of Revelation is one of the few places in the New Testament where you can ventilate hatred and feel pious about it. It's revolution, right? It's war, it's blood. It's a lot of terror, a lot of suffering. In modern times, millions await signs that the apocalypse is at hand, and some have followed its prophecies to tragic ends. Why was the book of Revelation written? Many believe that this barren site in northern Israel may hold the answer to this question. According to the Bible, this will be the location of Armageddon, the end of the world. But is mankind destined for an apocalyptic confrontation? Who wrote the book predicting this fateful battle? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. Every year, thousands of tourists flock to this ancient site in northern Israel, whose name evokes fear in those who believe in the biblical apocalypse, the violent end of the world. You are welcome to the Mount of Megiddo, Hotel Megiddo, very famous in the world among the Christians with the name Armageddon. And I saw issuing from the mouth of the beast three evil spirits like frogs for they are demonic spirits who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty and they assembled them at the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon Revelation 16 13 Armageddon the great whore of Babylon four horsemen of the apocalypse. These ghastly images from the book of Revelation repel and fascinate the world. The book of Revelation is the Bible's final book. In a series of strange and powerful visions, it foretells God's final judgment of humanity and the terrible annihilation of the earth. Many have believed it the work of a genius, others the ravings of a madman. The book of Revelation is essentially about how God is going to come and return to the planet and depose the ruler of the world, the devil. That's going to cause tremendous upheaval. It's revolution, it's war, it's blood, it's a lot of terror, a lot of suffering. The book of Revelation is, in fact, letters written to seven churches during the first century of the Common Era. 
The book also contains a dark, nightmarish vision predicting the violent end of the world. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Revelation 11, 18. The perspective of this book is the world is a horrible place in terms of human evil and suffering, that people are just doing terrible, terrible things. They lie and they cheat and they commit adultery and murder and their deeds of evil are just heaping up to the heavens. That's the image of the book. And, and the people that are good are being trampled and they are crying out all the time, God, why don't you come and how long until you will come and stop this, you see? In 1993, the tragic confrontation between the FBI and the Branch Davidians stunned the United States and proved that despite its ancient origins, the Book of Revelation remains a powerful force today. For those who died at Waco believed in the apocalypse and were inspired by earlier generations who believed the end was near. William Miller was an American Army captain in the War of 1812. After the war, he retired to his farm in Upper New York State and dedicated his life to reading the Bible. After long and difficult study, Miller believed he had discovered the key to deciphering the mysterious prophecies in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. He predicted that the apocalypse would occur sometime in the years 1843 and 1844. William Miller's prediction launched one of the largest apocalyptic movements in history. At one point, uh, the estimates are that he had as many as uh, 500,000 followers. He had charts of the beast and the horns and had it all figured out down to the date that it was supposed to come. And uh, that led to uh, what they call the Great Disappointment. William Miller's apocalypse did not take place, but his Millerite movement never faltered. Today, its spiritual descendants far outnumber the original half million believers. Over seven million Seventh-day Adventists and four million Jehovah's Witnesses trace their spiritual descent in part from William Miller. I think we can conservatively count tens of millions of people do believe that we might be living in the end times and the book of Revelation is going to be fulfilled quite literally in our lifetime in the next uh, generation or so. David Koresh and the Branch Davidians were also inspired by the Millerite movement. In Waco, Texas, their world ended in fire. What is this book that holds so many modern minds in its ancient, powerful grip? How can we explain its enduring fascination? Why do millions still believe that its terrifying visions will someday come true? For nearly 2,000 years, Christians have wondered when the final days foretold in the book of Revelation would come to pass, and with them, a better world. But despite its horrors, the Revelation has also given Christianity some of its most moving poetry of hope. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I heard a great voice saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, 1. 
Well, I think the book of Revelation has appealed to Christians when they feel that they are, their hopes are being crushed. This holds out you know, uh, for very threatened communities uh, uh, a, a vision of, of, of a new life, of a possibility of new life. And that's a perennial message, I think. But in ancient times, many Christians were appalled by the Revelation's bloody portrayal of God's wrath and judgment. Some even believed that the book should not be in the Bible. A lot of people did not like Revelation in the ancient world, just like a lot of people in the modern world find it a very dangerous book. Uh, as late as the 400s, uh, there was strong division amongst Christians whether Revelation ought to be read aloud in public. Many uh, Christian theologians have ignored the book of Revelation and even argued against putting it out of the canon because it's in conflict with their picture of Jesus. And their picture of Jesus is expressed most clearly in the Sermon on the Mount. And especially within that sermon, the sayings about turning the other cheek and loving your enemies. So that they see that as quintessentially Jesus, whereas the book of Revelation speaks about violence and punishment of enemies. As the final days begin, God sends four terrible horsemen to wreak his vengeance on a sinful world. The first three bring conquest, war, and famine. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are among the Bible's most terrifying figures. But the fourth horseman is the most frightening of them all. Behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. Revelation 6, 7. While the four horsemen ravage humanity, a devastating earthquake rocks the earth. The sun turns black, the moon turns to blood, and the stars fall from the sky. Seven angels blow seven trumpets, and a third of humanity perishes. But even greater horrors are to come. And there were flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and the cities of the nations fell, and every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones dropped from heaven, till men cursed God. Revelation 16, 17. At the book's climax, an angel hurls Satan, a great red dragon, into a bottomless pit. For humanity comes God's final terrible judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, and by what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20:11. The way God is portrayed in apocalyptic literature is primarily as the executor of justice. There is no suggestion of God waiving the rules for anybody, of God letting anybody off at the final judgment. One of the Revelation's most frightening symbols is the number 666. Today, 666 is widely believed to be the devil's number, and a sign that the final days have come to pass. But was this the original meaning of 666? The 
the island of Patmos, one of dozens of tiny islands scattered between Greece and Turkey across the Aegean Sea. Today, as in antiquity, Patmos is a quiet place, remote from the world. But every year, Christians come to visit its holy sites. This tiny island holds a place of highest honor in Christian tradition. For it was in this cave on Patmos that many think the book of Revelation was written by a man who remains one of the Bible's most mysterious figures, the visionary known only as John. Traditionally, a lot of Christian interpreters assume that this was the John, the apostle that wrote the, or thought to have written the Gospel of John. But uh, today, most biblical scholars uh, looking at the very different theology in these two books and very different style are not tempted to associate uh, those two Johns. So who is this John? Well, that's something of a, a mystery. If the John who wrote the book of Revelation was not St. John the Evangelist, could he have been John the Baptist? This has been another theory about John's mysterious identity. But careful study of the Revelation's literary style has convinced most biblical scholars that its author was neither St. John nor John the Baptist. On Patmos, John is still commemorated in the church and monastery that bear his name. Today, visitors to these venerable monuments may contemplate magnificent treasures of early Christian art and the unknown mystic whose ancient visions are still so powerful today. But for those who seek solutions to the Bible's mysteries, Clues to the identity of John are few indeed. One clue may be found in the Revelation's most famous symbol. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. Revelation 13, 1. For those who believe in the literal truth of the apocalypse, 666 has become the occult key to identifying the Antichrist, the satanic beast who rules the world. The discovery of any link between a famous person and Revelation's dreaded number produces immediate claims that the end is near. Probably the most humorous uh, interpretation of 666 that I've read is before the uh, Reagan election, a pamphlet went around claiming that Reagan was the beast of Revelation because he's the only American president who has six letters in each of his three names. So 666, therefore he must be the Antichrist. That's just a complete misunderstanding of the way ancients use numbers. In the ancient world, letters were also numbers. Each letter of the Greek alphabet has a numerical value. Scholars have discovered that the letters in Revelation, which add up to 666, also spell the name of a very famous person from ancient times. Behold the beast, Nero Caesar, hated, dissolute Roman emperor, first persecutor of the Christians in Rome. After Nero's suicide, many feared he would return to life and once again torment the world. If Nero was the beast, then the book of Revelation was probably written soon after his rule, which ended in the year 68 of the Common Era. When Nero died, Jews living in the Roman Empire might well have believed the world was coming to an end. The people of Judea were fighting a bloody war against their Roman masters, 
which would end with the utter destruction of Holy Jerusalem and its temple. The victorious Romans enslaved and massacred the rebellious people of Judea. Many fled, seeking sanctuary among the Jewish communities which flourished throughout the empire. Was one of these refugees the author of the book of Revelation? He's probably from Palestine because his Greek isn't very good. He probably, his native tongue is Aramaic, so either from Palestine or Babylon. Uh, he's probably Jewish in his background because he seems to be in strong contention with the Jewish community. Um, and he is some kind of a wandering prophet. The opening chapters of the book of Revelation are letters John wrote to seven churches in the cities of Roman Asia Minor. In the first century CE, these seven cities were a ring of jewels in the crown of Rome's Eastern Empire, centers of commerce and culture, prospering under imperial protection. In the seven cities, the Jewish Christian John was safe from the slaughter in Judea, but he soon began fighting a new war against fellow Christians whose worship John held to be blasphemous. I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed and I will strike her children dead. Revelation 2:19. Was John waging war against Christians who worshipped pagan idols? Probably not. But John almost certainly knew Christians who wanted to worship Jesus and carry on their lives as citizens and workers. In the seven cities, this meant compromising with paganism. John's point of view is that if you participate in the social structures of these cities, in Asia Minor, you will be engaging in idolatry. And to a certain extent, he was right that, you know, in our day, we have a separation of church and state. Religion is a private matter, and unions, for example, normally don't have religious ceremonies when they have their meetings. But in the trade guilds of Thyatira, one of the seven cities, they would. You know, that a trade guild, the ancient equivalent of a union, would be dedicated to a particular deity. And when they would have meals together, they would offer sacrifice and prayers and so forth to their deity. So the question was, can a Christian participate in this? John's answer was no. In his apocalypse, he envisioned dreadful torments for Christians who refused to abandon their worldly lives. Today, we may find him excessively harsh, but in the ancient world, dominated by the pagan gods, John's refusal to compromise his beliefs may have served its purpose. Perhaps he was extreme, but if there hadn't been some people like him, Christianity might not have survived. You know, it may have become assimilated. And that, I think, is why there is so much um, terrible imagery in the book. It's not so much to scare outsiders, but it's to scare insiders, to keep them on the straight and narrow path. Today in Ephesus, proudest and richest of the seven cities, the tomb of a Christian named John the Elder is commemorated as John's final resting place. But there is no evidence that John the Elder was the author of the book of Revelation, any more than John the Baptist or John the Apostle. The man himself may always remain an enigma. His terrible vision survives for us to ponder.
And as we try to fathom its mysteries, we must journey back even farther into the past. In Christian tradition, the book of Revelation is the powerful vision of a single mind. But when John wrote his apocalypse, he was following a tradition centuries old, a tradition born from the sufferings of the Jewish people. Long before the book of Revelation, a series of disasters destroyed the once proud kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans conquered the Jewish homeland. It is perhaps not surprising that around 200 BCE, a new kind of Jewish prophecy began to appear, an apocalyptic prophecy which predicted the violent end of the world and the coming of a righteous kingdom of God. There's not a lot of hope in the first century other than the apocalyptic hope. I mean, the Jews don't have a chance in the world of mounting an army and overthrowing Rome. But what if we have 12 legions of angels, you see, helping us? Then you can win. In the biblical book of Daniel, written over 200 years before the book of Revelation, a series of mysterious visions foretells the great kings of the earth waging bloody war until the archangel Michael brings the final judgment. Some of these visions bear an uncanny resemblance to visions in the Revelation. Listen to these words from the book of Daniel. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, the first was like a lion, and behold, another beast, like a bear, and lo, another, like a leopard, and behold, a false beast, it had ten horns. Daniel 7, 2. Now listen to these words from the book of Revelation. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads. And the beast I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Revelation 13, 1. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation go hand in hand. Revelation is really an interpretation of the book of Daniel. So it's interesting that 200 years or so before Jesus, people were reading Daniel and saying this is the time. By the end of the first century BCE, a small group of Jewish militants living in the desert were ready for war. At Qumran, near the Dead Sea, the Essenes were praying for the final days to begin, so they could join forces with the armies of heaven and fight the evil rulers of the earth. Among the mysterious writings found at Qumran, known today as the Dead Sea Scrolls, is the War Rule a detailed set of instructions for fighting the ultimate battle when the heavenly sons of light will destroy the satanic sons of darkness. On the day of calamity, the sons of light shall battle with the company of darkness amid the clamor of gods and men and it shall be a time of great tribulation from its sudden beginning until its end in eternal redemption. The Dead Sea Scrolls.
Who are the mysterious sons of light and sons of darkness? These apocalyptic warriors may be much older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Searching back hundreds of years through ancient texts, we encounter them centuries before the Essenes, in the faith of one of Israel's most powerful neighbors. Today, hundreds of miles east of Jerusalem, the magnificent ruins of Persepolis are all that remains of one of antiquity's greatest empires, the Empire of Persia. Until they became Muslims in the 7th century CE, Persians practiced their own ancient religion, a religion founded by a mysterious prophet who has long intrigued historians. The prophet named Zoroaster. Several centuries before Jews and Christians, Zoroaster predicted a final battle between good and evil and a last judgment. Zoroaster taught that life was a cosmic battle between the divine forces of light and the demonic forces of darkness. He prophesied that at the end of time, a savior will come to earth to resurrect the dead, reward the good, and punish the wicked. Did the biblical apocalypse originate in the teachings of a Persian prophet? Perhaps Zoroaster's predictions of total war appeal to the angry, desperate Essenes of Qumran. But Zoroaster's cosmic battle is very different from the revelations of apocalyptic visions. One of the things about Revelation that I find very intriguing is that John refuses to follow his models at certain crucial points. For example, the final battle between good and evil never occurs. There is no battle scene. Other apocalyptic works describe this final battle in great detail. Uh, for John, the battle is assembled and it's declared to be over. I think that's because in John's mind, the battle with evil is already over because Jesus has gained victory over evil by his death. Persians, Jews, and Christians all agreed that the final days when they came would be horrible indeed. Today, John's vision of that awful battle still moves and frightens us whenever we hear the dreaded name Armageddon. Where is Armageddon? The Bible simply tells us it is the place where the kings of the earth will assemble for the final battle. Did Armageddon exist only in John's vision? Or is the Bible's most terrifying battlefield to be found on Earth? Today, in northern Israel, the ancient mound of Megiddo broods like an eternal sentry over the valley of Jezreel. In the book of Revelation, John of Patmos foretold that the kings of the earth would meet in this place for a gigantic battle which would signal the end of the world. In the Hebrew language, Megiddo is called Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, Armageddon. But why did John choose Megiddo? Today it is one ruined city among dozens which cover the landscape of Israel. What made John believe that the final battle would begin here? The answer may lie in the land of Israel itself. The city of Megiddo was founded 4,000 years before John wrote the book of Revelation in one of the most strategic locations in the ancient Near East. The great road which connected Egypt to the empires of Mesopotamia passed through the valley of Jezreel. At Megiddo, the road divides. 
these three roads connected all the kingdoms of the Near East. Ancient Megiddo was located literally at the crossroads of its world. And whoever controlled those crossroads controlled trade, and more importantly, the movement of armies from the pyramids to Babylon. From the day it was founded, Megiddo was doomed to be a place of battles. The wretched enemy has entered into Megiddo. He has gathered to him the princes of every foreign country. Their horses, their armies, and their people. The capturing of Megiddo is the capturing of a thousand towns. Pharaoh Tutmos III. The date was May 12th, 1468 BCE, nearly 15 centuries before John wrote his apocalypse. Egypt's Pharaoh Tutmos III destroyed an alliance of princes, the earliest historical record of a battle at Megiddo. Archaeologists have discovered that when Tutmos III conquered Megiddo, the city had already been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. Although Egyptian accounts speak of Megiddo, it is more likely that John knew of the city's past from the Hebrew Bible. The kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan by the waters of Megiddo. Judges 6:19. Today, the ruins of massive walls are battered reminders of Megiddo's violent past. In the time of King Solomon, around 950 BCE, these walls protected a city which was twice the size of Jerusalem and the most heavily fortified city in Israel. In 950 BCE, while the Jews were fortifying Megiddo, many other things were happening around the world. In Mexico, the Olmecs were constructing huge ritual mounds. In China, workers were perfecting the art of casting bronze. And in Italy, villagers were building the first straw huts of a tiny settlement named Rome, which would one day conquer all of Israel. But massive walls are not the most impressive evidence of ancient Megiddo's strength, nor of its ever-ending fear. Cutting hundreds of feet through solid rock, the people of Megiddo dug this tunnel underneath their walls, a safe path to their water supply. It is a tribute to ingenuity and a testament to terror. The people of Megiddo never knew when the next enemy would arrive. When Megiddo was finally abandoned in the 4th century BCE, it had been inhabited continuously for over 3,000 years. It had been destroyed and rebuilt at least 20 times. It was, truly, a place where the kings of the earth had met. But what John of Patmos actually wrote about Armageddon differs considerably from what millions of people believe will someday happen there. Book of Revelation never mentions a battle of Armageddon. 
What it does mention is that right before the coming of Jesus Christ, the armies of the world will gather at Megiddo. The battle's not at Megiddo. Uh, it's, it's where you muster your troops and get, uh, get them ready. And then you march down to Jerusalem. So the battle is actually for Jerusalem. But regardless of where they are to happen, the final battle and the judgment day have captured the imagination of the world. Millions have seen the beast in the monsters of modern times. For those who believe, each new conflict raises the fear of the apocalypse and the hope of redemption. But those who seek answers to the Bible's mysteries remain divided on the Revelation's ultimate meaning. It raises hope in people that life is worthwhile and that we're right on the edge of something very uh, earth-shaking earth and changing and it inspires people to think that uh, history is not just this tired tale of repeated tragedy, injustice, evil, suffering, meaningless patterns of uh, senseless killing, but that it's reached some climax, and right ahead is that opportunity for something new. The number of people who've, who've sold all their goods and went out and sat on the hillside and waited for the end to come are legion, but they're still sitting there, or they had to foolishly go back to their homes the next day and say, uh, you know, it didn't happen that way. John is not presenting us with a literal vision of the end. He's presenting us with a symbolic, symbolic vision of the struggle between good and evil that every human person has to engage in at one time or another in their life. We American Christians should not read Revelation and identify with John in these seven churches. We, we should read this as a condemnation of us. And I think it's very, it's very good for uh, contented, wealthy American Christians to listen to how people in Latin America read Revelation or how the black churches read Revelation. And even though Revelation does not advocate human violence against other humans, it can be used in that way. You know, it's a short step from imagining violence to acting violence. I have a severe problem with the traditional reading of Revelation because I think that finally it's an immoral reading. It's a reading that sees Revelation as saying that good is going to overcome evil simply because good is more powerful than evil. So that the final value in the universe is power and the way to overcome evil is by force. Evil is overcome not by a divine warrior from heaven but by a lamb, a lamb who has been slain. The final battle is already over, not because evil has been beat by power, but because evil has been beat by love. Is the book of Revelation a timeless moral drama, or a ghastly blueprint for the end of time? However we interpret it, the ancient vision of John of Patmos lives on. A moving plea for compassion and love and a bitter cry for vengeance and annihilation. After nearly 2,000 years, there is no evidence that humanity will ever lose its fascination with the Bible's final book, or that we will ever unravel all of its secrets.